What's up, everybody? Today, I'm going to be giving more in-depth information on the most important and least understood aspect of camshaft selection and engine optimization. This is the most detailed video out there as far as showing and explaining the effects of lobe separation angle with more examples of lobe separation angle in one place than ever before seen on the internet. I will also be showing how to adjust duration according to optimal LSA while maintaining a specific amount of overlap. Today we'll be going on a drive and I will be sharing information with data proof that I would usually only consider giving to family or a close friend. I will be showing with 100% proof how to produce the most pound feet per cubic inch all the while making the highest horsepower and torque across the entire curve. I repeat, the entire curve out of any given cubic inch conventional headed V8 engine combination without variable valve timing via the positive effects of valve placement produced by the optimal LSA. I will also be showing how optimal LSA is calculated. This will be a more in-depth continuation of a specific part of my last very successful, highly praised and rather controversial camshaft video that had apparently hurt some feelings amongst the YouTube community. It had also gotten the attention of Brian Tooley, whom I had had a debate with in the comments. David Vizard had also commented on that video and said, I quote, what a cool presentation. I wish I was that smooth, end quote. In that video, I had proven all this camshaft information correct with data all the while disproving Mr. BT, who is one of the most well-known LS performance part and camshaft manufacturers, who has an overgeneralized, incomplete, and incorrect theory of camshaft lobe separation angle. Now the typical effects of all this information, along with the positive increase in performance that could be had with the optimal lobe separation angle, was missed by a lot of people in the last video. So this time I will be going deeper specifically into the aspects of what happens when you get close to the optimal lobe separation angle, why it happens. I will also show that what happens when the LSA is completely incorrect and what's going on dynamically when it's incorrect, both of which I will have dyno sheets for. I will also be showing three different engine examples with dyno data, which proves that there is absolutely only one optimal LSA, along with proof of the effective increase in torque, horsepower, and performance that can be expected across the entire curve from selecting the optimal lobe separation angle and why it has that effect dynamically. Now I'm going to try to keep this video as short as possible and to the point while providing the most information possible. So no matter what you hear from anyone, and I had proven this in my last video, there is absolutely only one optimal lobe separation angle for any given cubic inch V8 engine combination. Now all this information in this video is relative to V8 engines without variable valve timing. When the optimal lobe separation angle is selected, it will be the only camshaft spec that when optimally selected, you will see a positive increase in both peak horsepower, torque, more horsepower past peak, and more horsepower and torque down low. Ultimately, you will see gains across the entire curve when the optimal LSA is implemented. So essentially, when you have the optimal LSA selected, you can have your torque and horsepower and eat it too. Today, we'll be going over five different dyno sheets, testing 17 different LSAs and a total of five different engine combinations, ranging from 350, 370, 402, and two 406 cubic inches. With five LSAs tested on the 350, three LSAs tested per test on the other four engines. Each test obviously has a different combination of LSAs, now I will be showing examples of LSAs that range from what would be considered really narrow or tight at 101 degrees, all the way to what would be considered really wide at 120 degrees, meaning we will see a good variation of results so y'all can get a good understanding of the typical effects of random changes in LSA and the effects produced by optimal LSA. I will also be analyzing each power curve and explanations will be given for why each LSA did what it did and what the optimal LSA would have been for that given engine and how the optimal LSA is achieved. Now, as I said a minute ago, at this very point in time, this video is the only place on the entire internet you will get all this rare in-depth information with this many dyno sheet examples broken down and explained like this, whether it be from videos or even reading. And I can say this with absolute certainty because I've spent a lot of time and I've looked literally everywhere to make sure the claim I just made about the rarity of this information 
is 100% correct. Now between David Visard, Andy from Unity Motorsports, and myself, who had learned this stuff differently as a child, this uncommon and valuable information is slowly becoming more and more available in video form online. And best of all, for those of you watching, it's all free. Now let's get down to business. So the first engine we're going to start with is a 406 cubic inch small block Chevy. It was tested with three camshafts, all with the same lift and duration. The only spec that changed was LSA. The LSAs tested on this engine were 101, 107, and 113, each of which have a six degree change in LSA. Now to start with, the 101 is on the extreme side, especially for a 406. Now notice the 101 made the most low RPM torque and horsepower, the most peak torque and mid-range horsepower, but at the top of the RPM range, it failed to make the most peak horsepower, and torque and horsepower actually fell off first. This is typical for an LSA that is what would be considered too tight. The 101 fell off first because it opened the intake valve too soon, which resulted in flow not being presented to the cylinder at the correct time, which resulted in incomplete cylinder filling at higher RPM. At high RPM, when the intake valve's opening too soon, it ends up pulling more combustible charge out of the exhaust during the overlap period. This is called over-scavenging the cylinder. This is a result of incorrect placement of overlap due to the intake valve opening position. This in combination with too much overlap and the intake valve closing sooner, which also increases cylinder pressure and in turn evacuates the cylinder more rapidly because of the increase in expansion ratio which then in turn acts on the intake harder, which further increases the amount of combustible intake charge being expelled out of the exhaust, which then results in a reduction in high RPM trapped volumetric efficiency. All of this in turn ends up reducing peak horsepower and the RPM at which peak horsepower is produced. This is why the 101 LSA's horsepower and torque falls off at peak before the other LSA's, and falls off after peak before the other LSA's, now we're going to move on to the 107 LSA. The 107 made the second highest low end torque and horsepower. It also made the second highest peak torque and mid range horsepower. The 107 made the second highest peak horsepower by two horsepower less than the 113. And peak horsepower with the 107 also fell off second, which is typical. Now we're going to move on to the 113. The 113 made the least amount of low end torque and horsepower by a lot due to less low RPM cylinder filling efficiency due to the intake valve opening and closing too late, which also reduces low to mid RPM volumetric efficiency and cylinder pressure. The 113 made the least amount of mid-range torque and horsepower by a lot, but the 113 did follow the typical trend of making the most horsepower, but only by two horsepower, just beating out the 107. Now, if you hadn't watched my last video, I had explained that I hadn't learned all this camshaft selection in LSA from David Visard's formula. I had learned camshaft selection and optimal LSA from my grandfather and my dad in years of experience. Now some of you may already know that I have 27 plus years of experience focused specifically on the dynamics of valve events, cylinder heads, and the physics of high performance engines. Now my grandfather was a physicist and engineer for Chevy and Pontiac and he had built race engines as did my dad who was an engineer, machinist, and welder. I had started learning a little before 8 years old. And then I had started working in my dad's machine shop at 10. I had built countless high performance engines from naturally aspirated blower, turbo, and nitrous. I have had pure success with one of my personal small block Chevys that spanked big blocks of all makes and displacements up to 500, 540 cubic inches. It was a 383 and it was spinning 47 inch tires through mud that was a little, little over four feet deep if you sunk into it. Now that takes a lot for a 383 to spin 47 inch tires, better than engines, up to 540 cubic inch big block Chevys. Now the way I learned all this stuff was extremely complex and hard to explain, but it lines up exactly with David Visard's results. So instead of getting deep into a bunch of complex science related to this subject, I will share a formula to simplify the selection of this complex input. Now I know these methods work. It will absolutely help you get the most pound feet per cubic inch in horsepower and torque across the entire curve out of any given naturally aspirated V8 engine combination without variable valve timing. Now the easiest way for you guys to select a starting point for the optimal LSA is a formula created by David Visard. 
It will give you the optimal LSA starting point for a 10.1 to 10.5 compression. I will also explain how to adjust the LSA starting point for optimal LSA in a second. Now this is how the optimal 105 LSA for the 406 small block Chevy was determined. The formula is 128 minus cubic inches divided by 8 divided by the valve diameter times 0.91 and that will give you the, co the correct starting point for the optimal LSA. Now I had given this formula in my last video but apparently I didn't explain it clearly enough because some people didn't get it. Now you have to start with the correct order of operations for the formula. So you have to do the stuff in the parentheses first. And then you minus that from 128. And that will give you your correct result. This result will be the starting point for optimal LSA. For example, if this 406 was 11.1 .1 to 11.5 compression, the LSA would need to be 106. If it was 12.1 .1 to 12.5 compression, it would require a 107. 13.1 to 13.5 would use a 108. Now this is an example to show that the first LSA produced by the formula may need to be wider to account for other aspects of the engine. Compression is one of the simplest adjustments to be considered after implementing the formula. Generally with any given engine compression, using the LSA produced by the formula, then simply adjusting the LSA according to the compression ratio and correctly choosing all the rest of the cam specs according to whatever your application and intended use. Just simply doing this will result in the camshaft better than 95 to 98% of the professionals could produce with their methods, and that is a fact. Now this next engine is a 10.5 to 1, 370 cubic inch small block Chevy. It was tested with three cams with the same lift and duration. The only thing that was changed once again was the LSA. The LSAs tested were 104, 110, and 114. There's of course 6 degrees of LSA between the 104 and the 110, and there's 4 degrees of LSA between the 110 and the 114. Now before we get started with this engine, I'm going to share some more rare information I came up with about cam spec conversion according to optimal LSA while maintaining a specific amount of overlap. Now you will definitely not see this anywhere else but here. Now to start with, here's a little known fact. Every two degree change in LSA equals a four degree change in overlap. Every four degree change in duration equals four degree change in overlap. Now, for example, you can maintain a specific amount of overlap according to the optimal LSA by adjusting the duration to maintain the overlap instead of changing the LSA to adjust overlap. Now, overlap is relative to the characteristics during the overlap triangle in relation to the cubic inches of displacement of the cylinder. The amount of overlap that is required to meet an application's needs depends on the RPM and the displacement in relation to the flow characteristics of the head and the valves at low lift flow. Now keep in mind that low lift flow is where the intake and exhaust valves are open during the overlap period. Now obviously the more RPM an engine is going to spin, the more overlap is needed, but only up to a certain point. Now the larger the cubic inches, the more overlap is needed for any given RPM range. Now conversely, the greater the low lift flow of the cylinder heads, the faster the valve opening accelerates, the faster the low lift flow is prevented to the, presented to the cylinder during the valve curtain area exposure, especially on the intake side, the higher the port energy or the higher the compression, all these equate to less overlap needed for optimal results. Now anybody that tells you that LSA or low lift flow don't matter has their head up their ass and they need to have their head removed from their ass and go and have it checked. The effect of overlap is relative to torque production at a specific RPM, which is relative to horsepower production at a specific RPM. Now I will show you guys how to convert a 116 LSA to say an optimal 106 LSA to maintain a specific amount of overlap of say 30 degrees at 50 thousandths and 88 degrees of overlap at advertised. By adjusting the duration to maintain the specific amount of overlap, instead of using LSA as a means to adjust overlap. Now always keep in mind, LSA sets the intake valve opening and closing points in the optimal location. Now just because two degrees of overlap, or two degrees of LSA equals four degrees of overlap, and four degrees of duration equals four degrees of overlap, it don't make sense to spec a cam with a wide LSA, like a 116, to maintain idle quality while being able to use more duration.
Now being as LSA sets the intake valve opening and closing points in the optimal position, it is incorrect to adjust LSA to achieve idle quality. In the mainstream cam industry, LSA is standard procedure to keep idle civilized and maintain vacuum while using more duration, but it is absolutely incorrect. Now here's an example of what I came up with that produces the exact same results as David Vizard's duration formula. But I use my specific way to do duration at 50 thousandths and advertised duration. Now the cam specs we're going to be converting is a 116 LSA with 262-262 due duration at 50 thousandths. Now the intake center line is going to be irrelevant right now. And the overlap on those cam specs at 50 thousandths is 30 degrees. Now we're going to maintain that 30 degrees of overlap to match the 106 LSA. So we take the 116 times 2 and that equals 232 plus 30 degrees of overlap at 50 thousandths. And that gave us the 262 duration at 50 thousandths. Now we're going to convert that to a 116 LSA while maintaining that 30 degrees of overlap. So you take 116 times 2, that equals 212 plus 30 at 50 thousandths. And that'll give us a 242 at 50 thousandths duration. Now those are our converted our converted cam specs at 50 thousandths. Now if you notice the converted cam specs, there's 10 degrees of LSA between the 116 and the 106. That 10 degrees of LSA equals 20 degrees of overlap. Now if we go to the duration at 50 thousandths, the 262 and the 242, there's 20 degrees of duration between the both of those. That 20 degrees of duration equals 20 degrees of overlap. So now we're going to do a conversion from a 116 LSA with a two or a 320 duration advertised with the 262 at 50 thousandths. Now this cam spec has 88 degrees of overlap. So we're going to maintain that 88 degrees of overlap and we're going to convert it to a one, 106. So we're going to go 106 times two equals 212 plus 88 degrees of overlap and that'll give us a 300 degree advertised duration. So the final result will have an optimal 106 LSA with 300 degrees of duration if advertised, 242 at 50 thousandths. And that'll give us 88 degrees of overlap maintained with 30 degrees of overlap maintained at 50 thousandths. Now we're maintaining a specific overlap because overlap is relative to RPM and power production. This is an example of adjusting duration accordingly to optimal LSA and overlap. Now these power curves from these two cams in a 10.5 to 1 383 with 202 intake valves would be drastically different. But the cam with the optimal 106 LSA and less duration with the same amount of overlap would make more horsepower and torque across the entire curve than the cam with the 116 LSA with more duration and the same amount of overlap. I would love to dyno test multiple cams spec accordingly to test and show the effects produced by the adjustments made to maintain an optimal LSA in a specific amount of overlap. Now if you understand cam specs and the effect of cam specs and you're able to accurately analyze dependent and independent data, and if you analyze the results pro produced by all these dyno sheets, you can get somewhat of an idea and imagine what the outcome of these adjustments would be. The camshaft industry either associates LSA with overlap, or for example, they consider it a result of valve event placement, then use excessive amount of exhaust duration, and then call it what an engine wants. In my last video, I had proved that theory incorrect. That is the theory of Mr. BT. He says LSA is irrelevant and don't focus on LSA. BT says LSA is just a derivative of intake center line plus exhaust center line divided by two, and that is LSA. So basically he says LSA has no function. When in actuality, optimal LSA, what it's doing is setting the intake valve open and closing points at the optimal position. Now starting with LSA produces those optimally placed valve events. Then the camshaft specs can be further optimized by overlap, duration, degrees of intake center line advance or retard ground into the intake lobe, lobe profiles, lobe symmetry, and changes in firing order. Then separate from camshaft specs, the valve events can be further optimized by the engine builder via the degrees of intake valve advance or retard when degreeing the camshaft upon installation. So now that I've given that piece of information, we'll get back to the dyno data for the 370 cubic inch small block Chevy.
We'll start with the 114. Now you'll notice the trends for the 114 and all the other LSAs is about in line with the last cheat. The 114 made the least peak torque, the least low to mid range torque and horsepower. The 114 also made the least peak horsepower, but past peak horsepower and torque, it fell off second, beating the 104 by about two horsepower at 7,000 RPMs. So now we're gonna move to the 110. The 110 made the second highest low to mid range torque and horsepower, the second highest peak torque, and the 110 made the most peak horsepower and carried the torque and horsepower longer past peak. Now we're gonna move on to the 104 LSA. The 104 made the most low to mid range torque and horsepower along with the most peak torque. The 104 also made the second highest horsepower by about one horsepower and fell off past peak second. The optimal LSA for this 370 cubic inch small block Chevy with 10 and a half to one compression and 202 intake valves would be a 107. Now a 107 would produce more torque and horsepower than the 104 across the entire curve and carry horsepower and torque past peak longer. Now the 107 LSA was determined once again by Mr. Vizard's formula. Now the results produced by these last two dyno sheets are the typical effects of LSA that are understood by about 98% of the so-called camshaft professionals in the mainstream, the mainstream camshaft industry. Now the next two engine examples are physical examples of the positive increase in torque and horsepower across the entire curve that can be produced with near optimal and absolutely optimal LSA. This next engine is a 402 cubic inch LS with 10 and a half to one compression and 2.165 intake valves. The LSAs tested on this engine were 120, 112, and 108. Now once again, they're following the typical trends with the widest LSA being the 120 made the least low to mid range horsepower and torque. It also made the least peak torque, but made the second highest horsepower and horsepower and torque fell off second to the 108. Now we're gonna move on to the 112. Now once again, the 112 made the second most low to mid range torque and horsepower. It also made the second highest torque production, but the 112 made the least horsepower, but at the same RPM as the 120. Torque production passed peak, but the 112 also fell off first. Now notice at the top of the RP RPM range, the 112 and the 120 are almost, are almost insensitive to change, being as peak horsepower is almost the same and at the same RPM. This is because the valve events created by the 112 and the 120 are already too wide for the cubic inches, cylinder head flow characteristics and compression to allow the cylinder head to be able to fill and evacuate the cylinder at the correct times to be able to increase the peak horsepower and RPM at which peak horsepower is produced. Simply put, in other words, the cylinder head flow characteristics and cubic inches don't match the valve events caused by the wide LSA. So the 402 cubic inch LS can't utilize the effects produced by the 112 or the 120, both of which are clearly incorrect. Now we're gonna move on to the 108 LSA. The 108 didn't produce the typical results you would expect after seeing the results produced by the previous dyno sheets. The 108 made the most low to mid range torque and horsepower. It, al it also made the most peak torque. The 108 ultimately increased torque and horsepower across the entire curve. The effect being produced by the 108 are the effects that are not understood well by the mainstream cam camshaft industry and most professional engine builders. The results produced by the 108 are typically written off as random occurrence, and that is obviously not the case. This is not an anomaly, and I can clearly see what's going on. The results produced by the 108 are the product of being extremely close to the ideal lobe separation angle, while having effective enough cylinder head flow to see the positive increase in horsepower and torque produced by the valve events created by the 108, which is two degrees away from the optimal 106 LSA. Now typically if you have cylinder heads with really good low lift flow or what's called a higher discharge coefficient and you get within one to two degrees of the ideal lobe separation angle, you will see a similar positive increase in performance. Now even though the power increase from the 108 isn't as big as it would have otherwise been had the absolute optimal LSA been installed, this can still only mean one thing and this is a prime example and a confirmation that the LSA has more of an effect and is more deep and complex than most people, even the supposed professionals in the camshaft industry can comprehend.
So the 108 peaked at 6,300 RPMs instead of 6,200 RPMs, like the 112 and the 120, which as I said is not typical for the random change in LSA. Now even though the change to the 108 LSA produced more peak horsepower, carried power longer, and produced 15 to 18 horsepower more past peak, it still didn't increase the horsepower and torque more than what would have otherwise been produced had the optimal LSA been installed for this specific cubic inch engine combination. Now I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible and as understandable as possible. And once again, you will not hear this information anywhere else on the internet. Now here's a breakdown of the 108 LSA and what's going on dynamically to produce the overall increase in power up top and across the entire curve. The 108 LSA opened the intake valve sooner, which allowed the flow to be presented to the cylinder earlier, specifically because the valve placement provided by the 108 LSA, which was better suited for the cubic inches, compression ratio, cylinder head flow characteristics, and many other aspects. Now being as the 108 LSA opened the intake valve sooner, which allowed flow to be presented to the cylinder earlier, which in turn allowed the cylinders to fill more efficiently and with the intake valve closing at near optimal position, it effectively trapped more combustible charge and in turn allowed the cylinders to evacuate more completely due to the increase in cylinder pressure and near optimal overlap placement in correlation to the intake valve opening point, which resulted in more clean charge being pulled into the cylinder, which once again results in more charge being trapped in the cylinder upon intake valve closing, allowing the engine to breathe all the way to the high RPM due to the overlap. Now being as the 108 LSA opened the intake valve sooner, which had allowed the cylinder head to present more flow to the cylinder, fill the cylinder more effectively, trap the most usable combustible charge, and evacuate the cylinder more completely. The efficient evacuation of the cylinder allows more usable gases to completely fill the cylinder. Then in turn, the intake valve closing point takes advantage and makes use of a near optimally filled cylinder both of which are increasing high RPM volumetric efficiency. Now once again, this all occurred simply as a result of the better combination of valve events produced by the 108 being two degrees away from optimal, which means proper LSA leads to optimal valve event timing. And this leads to better horsepower and torque across the entire curve, which equals better performance. Now this next engine is a prime example of absolute optimal LSA and will solidify what I had said earlier about optimal LSA making more horsepower and torque across the entire curve than an LSA that is tighter. Which as you've seen earlier, a tighter LSA usually makes more low to mid range horsepower and torque, more peak torque, than usually falls off up top first. Now all this goes against the typical understanding of camshaft lobe separation angle. And like I said, this knowledge is rare and has been rather controversial. The effects produced by optimal LSA are said to be impossible by many because of the lack of knowledge and understanding. Well, the controversy is now over and the truth will be clear to see. So the next engine is a 10 to 1, 350 cubic inch small box Chevy tested with five LSAs. Each LSA had a two degree split. They ranged from 114, 112, 110, 108, and 106. This 350 cubic inch small box Chevy is a prime example that optimal LSA exists and it shows more of the positive increase in power across the entire curve. This dyno sheet just shows torque, but the torque produced across the entire curve correlates with the horsepower increase across the entire curve. So ultimately there was an increase in horsepower and torque across the entire curve. Now simply explained, LSA produces the beginning of optimal placement of the intake valve opening position, intake valve closed position, optimal overlap placement in correlation to the intake valve opening position, which in turn will provide the base for optimal scavenging of the cylinder, which allows the intake valve opening position to more completely fill the cylinder, enabling the intake valve closing position to take advantage of an optimally filled cylinder. All of this results in an increase in trapped volumetric efficiency and across, the, across the entire RPM range, which means more horsepower and torque across the entire curve. Now, if we run the formula for a 350 cubic inch small block Chevy with 202 intake valves and 10.5 to 1 compression, it'll give us a 108 LSA 
Now, as you can see, the 108 LSA produced the, higher, the highest power output. And as I said earlier, an optimal LSA will always produce more torque and horsepower across the entire curve. This goes against what the professionals in the camshaft industry would figure and understand and goes way beyond the knowledge of most engine builders. Now, most wouldn't figure the 108 LSA would do what it did. Most would assume the 106 would continue the trend and would make the fattest power curve with less peak power because the typical trends produced by the tighter LSA is shown on the last two dyno sheets. The optimal LSA is the beginning of optimal valve event timing and engine performance. Now, being as it's the base of optimal valve events because Optimal LSA sets the intake valve opening and closing points in the optimal location. You must present flow to the cylinder and fill the cylinder early enough at a critical point. And if the intake valve is open too late, the cylinder head will not catch up as far as the ability to fill the cylinder and trap a sufficient amount of combustible intake charge. Even with the ramming effect or inertial column supercharging at bottom dead center and after bottom dead center, with the late intake valve opening and closing position, it in turn will not, I repeat, will not, help recover the loss and trap clean combustible intake charge in the cylinder, aka it will not recover the loss and volumetric efficiency from incorrect intake valve opening and closing events. When you have a properly tuned high performance engine, you will create a high and low pressure wave in the intake and exhaust that will aid in cylinder filling. When the low pressure wave in the exhaust reflects on the intake, this pressure delta pulls air and fuel into the cylinder. When you don't have correct valve events, i.e. intake valve opening and closing events, and overlap placement, you can't have optimal wave tuning. This wave tuning is what helps performance engines achieve volumetric efficiencies of more than 100%. And the effects of wave tuning begin with valve events, and optimal valve events start with optimal lobe separation angle, which is absolutely the base of optimal valve events. End of story. Now simply explained, LSA produces the beginning of optimal placement of the intake valve opening position, intake valve closed position, optimal overlap placement in correlation to the intake valve open position, which in turn will provide the base for optimal scavenging of the cylinder which allows the intake valve opening position to more completely fill the cylinder, enabling the intake valve closing position to take advantage of an optimally filled cylinder. All of this results in an increase in trap volumetric efficiency across the, across the entire RPM range, which means more horsepower and torque across the entire curve. Now I said I was gonna try to keep this as short as possible, and I'm pretty sure I've proven my point, giving y'all some for your brain to digest. So I'm going to cut this off for now. If you haven't seen my last video, I recommend checking that out. You will get a further understanding of the complex input that is lobe separation angle and how to apply it to your builds. I will attach a link to that video at the end of this. I hope this helped y'all have a more complete understanding of the effects of lobe separation angle. And if you like this video, I'd appreciate if you hit like, give me a sub. And if you sub, be sure to hit that notification bell so you get alerts when I drop videos and community posts. Also, check out David Vizard for more information similar to this. So until next time, for those of you who don't know, I'm Adam. This is Cattle Dog Garage. Thank you for watching. Take care, everybody. I'll catch you next time. My bit of advice today is don't focus on LSA. Don't focus on LSA. Don't focus on LSA. Don't focus on LSA.